and then you got to adjust your sound for this voice. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> My name is Michael Lent. I am a 67 year old man, retired mechanic, arbitration manager of automotive auctions. I'm married. I have three children and four grandchildren. And my name is Charles Ray Mason. I go by Ray. I met Eddie probably in 2016, 2017. All of this happened in my search to address a new diagnosis of multiple myeloma cancer. Eddie Funkster. I was an uh, all around neighborhood thug having fun in the ghettos. I wanted a way and access out of it. At the time, uh, Proposition 215 came on the ballot, and that's kind of been my entire drive since then. I'm a, kind of a plant guy. Cannabis is one of my very loving plants that I've done a lot of work with. All the seeds, all the plants, everything in general, I'm pretty much uh, a, a street botanist. My name's uh, Ken Olson. I'm uh, 41 years old. I'm a, a father of four. I do that as a team now, actually, with somebody else, um, not with my original partner. A lot of cancer in my family. A lot of cancer. My grandmother died of pancreatic cancer. My grandfather, colon cancer. An aunt, lung cancer. Another aunt, brain cancer. Another aunt, breast cancer. Um, my brother had uh, thyroid cancer. My mother, she had ovarian cancer that she was treated for, and she went through uh, surgery and chemo. I was a young teen mom. I had a daughter at 14 years old, and I realized at a, that age that if I smoked weed, that my anxieties of being a mom went away, um, and I was a better mom. And I know that at that time, and it was very, taboo. You're not even supposed to be smoking weed, period. I, I honestly was struggling because I had nobody in my peer group to talk to. Nobody had kids. It was me. Started in the early 90s, around 91. Uh, that was the first time I ever smoked a joint. Um, a friend of ours, some girl I liked, thought she was nice, pretty. She pulled out a joint, I took a hit of it, didn't do really much to me. A couple years later when I became a freshman in high school, I hit a bonk for the first time and it really put me in a very unusual space and I didn't know if I liked it or if I didn't. I just knew that I took too much at the first time. So I was kind of on the fence about it. So I felt alone and um, smoking weed put me in a place where I could actually calm myself down and get on my child's level in such a way I've never been able to do with any anything. And I was just honestly a better mom, more in tune with her and had a great time. and. It just, I didn't have to take anything over the counter or prescription wise that probably would have damaged me. I was uh, a very bad kid in school. I lived in the projects. And so I was used to, uh, I was totally against authority, teachers, cops, everything. One of my teachers was like, hey, Eddie, uh, my history teacher, she was like, you seem like a good kid and I don't want you to fail this class. You've been failing all your classes for years. And you know, I, th I think you have potential. And she said, if you go uh, to the registers office and just do anything with any of the ballots get signatures go door to door make phone calls I'll pass you in this class get a piece of paper. So I said, okay, cool So I go down to the registers office Medical marijuana They need a signatures. So I said, hey, I'll do this. I said, all right, cool So they stood me up in my local grocery store and I got signatures. I was 17 years old. The law passed I passed my class, you know, it was amazing. I got to see in that class and so this whole wheels just started turning about what this movement was, first it was a couple of friends of mine getting cannabis cards and not getting in trouble running around with a couple of pounds of weed. And that made a lot of sense to me at the time. I didn't feel like it was a bad thing and the projects where I was at, people were selling crack cocaine, people were selling heroin and methamphetamine and that was, those drugs were terribly ravaging the neighborhood and causing huge disruptions in families. Um, my stepfather was addicted to heroin, slamming heroin with, with, 
with needles and stuff. And so I was very, very in, immersed in, in the terrible culture of drugs. I wanted a way out. And one thing I couldn't figure out was how to get out. We didn't have many opportunities there. The schools that we went to, there's not a lot of counseling services or any positive drives. So you had this, had this two influences in my face at school. I had these people that were thuggish, running, running rough, uh, had no positive drive in their life. And then I had these kids that were getting tremendous support from their family and going to college and learning things. And so I, I was never against, you know, doing better in life. And so I started realizing like, uh, used to tell my friends like, hey you guys, you know, you guys are selling, you know, weed and, and drugs and stuff to each other. Nobody's gonna ever get better than who you're getting your stuff from. And we're only selling stuff to each other here in these projects. We're only gonna live in the next project department over. We're never gonna leave the projects. We have to learn how to get money from those people up there that have money every week. They get a paycheck. They get a, what drives them, what influences them, and not drugs. Like, can we do art? Can we make music? I became a musician. I was an artist for years. And those people kind of directed me and pulled me out of the projects and they showed me other and I got to see other things. Those people were still very much into cannabis. And one of the things that I was very successfully blessed with was an access to very, very good quality cannabis. When the medical cards came in, I just felt like it was time to get one. So I got one and it was mostly just to protect me from growing weed so I can provide for my, my sons. I started to meet patients, started to meet people and it made sense. I am an ER doctor who has segued into cannabis work and still work in the emergency department. I work with patients with cannabis only in the office at the Relief Institute here in Santa Monica, California. So I started all of this about three or four years ago when my two very close family members were diagnosed with cancer. Both of them were at different stages. Uh, one had breast cancer and was young, uh, relatively young, a 40-year-old woman, and one was older in his 60s or 70s and was diagnosed with esophageal cancer. Both of them were recommended by their physicians to start using cannabis products. Both their oncologists say, you should probably smoke pot and it'll help. And that was the end of the conversation. And so when I went in and discussed all of this with the oncologist, the same question kept coming up. Well, what are they supposed to do? How are they supposed to do it? How often are they supposed to use it? What is it good for? What is it not good for? What should we look out for? I, you know, we don't want her to be high all day because she's got little kids around. How do we do this better? And what ended up happening, which I know happens for a lot of individuals, is we went into a quote unquote pot shop and uh, talked to a bud tender who sometimes gave us good advice and sometimes didn't give us good advice. And so for the 40 year old female, she did really well and kind of figured it out. For the 70 year old male, he didn't. And that was where I thought if something so good is being touted by so many people as being helpful, especially in terms of cancer control or cancer symptomatic treatment control, then why is it that we're not able to do this better? And why is it that the physician group, you know, the medical clinical world is turning their backs on these patients? And that was what prompted me to make a change in my personal career and my um, path in understanding all of this. You gonna mug me? I might gotta mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veeley now. When I was a sophomore in high school, a good friend of mine got abdominal cancer and his mom used to come to the projects and buy an ounce of weed from us every week. And we had a talk with her one time. We said, why are you buying him weed? He doesn't even like to smoke weed. She was, oh, his cousin came over and he, his cousin, or uh, my friend Forrest, rest your soul, it's been many years. He liked to drink. And so his cousin came, he was like, man, I don't drink liquor. I want to smoke a joint with you. And Forrest was like, man, I can't, they can't smoke. You know, I'm, I've got cancer, I'm dying. And he's like, that's why you should smoke some weed. So he gave Forrest a hit. Forrest got an appetite, started feeling better. His mom recognized this thing. She came to us in the projects and started buying him weed. It still didn't resonate with me yet that these are the things that were making sense to me of cannabis and how it helps people. She was uh, 37 years old and she had been complaining like about uh, headaches for a couple of years and um, starting to get lumps in her throat and stuff and went to doctors over and over and over and every single one of them biopsies and everything and everything was fine. That's when I got the call that uh, she was in the hospital. And I rushed down and um, 
told her that everything was going to be cool. Uh, I actually, I talked to Eddie before I ever made it home to her. The movement just kept thrusting me into this. I meet a person with cancer and it was almost the same story. He was like, I don't really smoke weed, I never really did. But the doctor suggested I seek cannabis. And so I was like, okay, cool, I can get you some cannabis, here's some weed. So we give him some weed and then he introduced me to somebody else and the door just started rolling. I had flour, I had weed, I was growing weed. I was facilitating cannabis to these patients. We call them patients, unfortunately, because that's how they recognize themselves. So I started going into the homes. I started going into houses and hospitals and people were just asking me if I could bring weed. And I was like, sure, I'll bring weed and see if this happens. A drastic change one day is when I went to the hospital and one of these people, this is the early 2000s, they asked me to come help their loved one. So I go into the hospital and I bring in a joint and I get ready to pull the joint out, get ready and the guy's barely alive. And he's like, no, no. What are you doing? Everybody in the hospital room is like, what are you doing? You're going to blow up this hospital. There's oxygen in this room. And I was like, what are you talking about? We breathe oxygen all the time. And they're like, hey, stupid from the ghetto, you need to learn something if you're going to come in here and try to help these people. He can't even breathe. He's on a breath on a respirator. How are you going to give him weed? How are you going to give him this? And it didn't make, and I was lost. I was completely sitting there in a world of failure. And instead of, you know, running and dealing with people that only want joints, I, I just expanded my my thoughts and started figuring out things and exploring and diving into other utilizations of cannabis besides a joint. I felt like a joint and a bong was, you know, what a lot of people were, were attacking and going after. They didn't like the hippie culture smoking a joint. They didn't like the glass culture for making bongs. And so it's, it made sense to me of like, okay, well, if I'm gonna help these sick people, maybe I need to stop coming in there with joints. So we learned how to make tinctures and we started making tinctures. And then I started going to hospitals and I started giving these droppers into people's tongues. And some of the, a lot of them were getting better and starting to feel better. And so this is the early 2000s and 2000, 2001. There was no information. There was no Oaksterdam University. There was no internet. There was, I mean, there was internet, but it was really scarce and farce information to, to find anything that was positive. I just kind of felt that people needed it. And the, the movement of the medicine was more important than the people that are the movement. You know, the, the movement's going to be there whether I'm here or not. And we learned that with Jack Herrera and Dennis Perone. They're gone and the movement is still very strong. And so I just learned that putting the plant on the pedestal and running with that pedestal of the plant is what the benefit of all this is and creating these products and listening to the people and respecting the plant, the information will just fall into your hands uh, to the point to where we started creating water hash, bubble hash, and we started making concentrates and learning what is these products doing to people when we're using them, coming all the way down to the line where we started creating suppositories for liver cancer patients that were had no access, they couldn't eat and take anything at oral, orally, they couldn't smoke, they couldn't eat, and how could you give them an edible, how could you give them a tincture? That stuff doesn't work, we have to utilize, we have to get cannabis into people because we know it heals. And so we started creating suppositories and giving these to thousands of people. I've, I've helped over 2,600 people pass, and that's what I thought medical marijuana was at the beginning of my years. I thought it was helping dying people, I was going to the hospice, I was going to home care, I was doing these things and I was watching these people pass away. She uh, was originally diagnosed with lung cancer that had metastasized the brain. By the time we saw any pictures of any of it, before any treatment was started with, uh, with the cannabis, she already had eight lesions in the brain. We started the treatments and within 30 days, we got her up to a full gram, which it was probably a little bit less than that actually because I remember thinking, wow, you know, we got her to a place where normally people take a month plus to get to that point so that they don't just end up in a comatose state and sleeping all the time. And she definitely was tired, but she didn't sleep all the time and her body started healing and reacting very well to the medicine. We went in for a scan and she actually had gone down to three lesions on the brain and we were completely excited. We went and had to go for a doctor's appointment and we went in. We actually sat first with the doctor's um, assistant. And when she saw the results, she was ecstatic with us and happy. And she actually condoned and, and asked for us to persist in the, the cannabis treatment where her own boss 
didn't agree with it. And all he would say is, you know, this is, you know, it's not going to do anything for her. And even when he saw the scans having five less lesions in the brain, he continued with the negativity and and really just pulling her down. So she went from a place of being positive and, and actually healing to pulled right back down to this place of negative frequency, just hopelessness, instead of knowing when she literally, she knew it, that she was healing and she told people about it, she was excited. And how on earth could you put something like that out there and to bring upon her your hopelessness of the situation? Again, I really feel that at the end of the day, when Danielle finally succumbed to the cancer, it was because she got to a point where she no longer believed. My mom was diagnosed with brain cancer many years after she had gone through the ovarian cancer. And when they found it, um, she had two different tumors in her brain and uh, they, they sent her home on hospice. I got asked to come to this home and I walk in the house and there's hospice. There's a couch here in the living room. I mean, there's a bed in the living room and the gentleman's in the bed. And this gentleman was very alive when I walked in that door. And he told me his military status, uh, this whole veteran, uh, this whole long list of what he's done in the military. And then he asked, what was I doing there? And I told him I was called to come and help you. At the time, I had dreadlocks so almost in my butt. And so he was like, who are you? I was like, well, I was asked to come and help you because you don't look like a doctor. You don't, you're not a doctor. And his daughter goes, um, Dad, I asked this gentleman to come here to help you. He's always, you bringing that weed stuff? I told you I'm not taking that weed stuff, not in my house, not in my clock, not on my time. And she's like, Dad, this is my home. You're here, I wanna help you, I love you. And he's like, I'm not taking this. Three hours later, he was dead. So he's sitting, I'm in this house. This gentleman's laying there, dead on the couch, dead on this, in his thing. And his daughter and his two sons are sitting there. But watching this in a room of complete silence. Death is a heavy, heavy feeling in a room. I sparked a joint. I lit the joint, I took a couple of hits. And I passed it to the daughter. And the daughter said, I can't do this. I'm a teacher. I can't, I can't. We, I was like, you asked me to come and give this to your father. I couldn't have done anything. If he would have took a hit, he wouldn't have been alive right now. He's too, too far gone. You know what this is for? Right there in that moment, it realized to me what cannabis was important for. It's for the people living right now that want to stay alive. The people that need to be alive. The people that have jobs, have family, have friends, have motivation, inspirations. People that want to go in the garden. People that want to paint cars. People that want to you know, go play golf or miniature golf or people that want to go sit down and have a meal with their friends and family and laugh and joke. That's what cannabis is for. It wasn't for this debilitating disorder where people are dying in their last breath of bed and hopefully we can give another 10 minutes so we can wait for Billy Bob to come in and give him a hug. I've watched that so many times over and I've watched families completely disintegrate after death. I've watched people fight over where did he bury the money? Did he tell you where he has the money? Did she tell you where the trust funds are? The other people I really cared about. And so in that, I just learned that it's the living people right now that are trying to understand purpose for their life, have a good night's rest, not be anxiety, depressed, full of road rage. That's what's most important about cannabis. It's all day moments, everyday things. It's not PTSD. There's no such thing as PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder? No, it's PTLD. And every human being on this earth has it. It's post-traumatic life disorder. And we're all suffering from it. And one thing I've learned out of happened to almost 3,000 people pass away, we're all terminal. Nobody's making it out alive. And we all need to just be appreciative of ourselves as the moments that we're here and being okay with right here, right now. And if right here, right now, I interact with somebody that is in chemotherapy, going through radiation, or has AIDS or some other dis debilitating disorder, and I give them size of a grain of rice of this, and I tell them to take it when they go to bed. You don't take it in the afternoon. You've never smoked cannabis in your entire life. I don't tell you to take this in the morning when you wake up with your cup of joe. No, I don't. I tell you, take this at night right before you go to bed. Take the effects while you sleep through it. Don't get excited. Don't freak out. Don't have a conversation with yourself feeling like you're in a psychedelic experience. Go to sleep. Take it. Go to bed. You can get a full night's rest. And 99.9999%, the nines keep going. Every single person I interact with, the first thing they tell me is they don't have a full night's of rest. It's the first thing this thing does is recharge the body and give you full rest. As soon as your body gets rest and recovery, your body can start healing. Most people, I tell them, you, you go to bed, let's say 10 o'clock at night. By one in the morning, I don't care who you are. You could be in a dead sleep. Your eyes open up, you wake up, and the rest of the time until your alarm goes off, you're tossing and turning and trying to figure out how to get back to sleep. You fall back asleep five minutes before your alarm goes back off.
friends of mine that I buy my weed from and various things told me about Eddie and I got on the internet and I researched him, I found him, I messaged him, I met him and he started taking care of me with his RSO, which, you know, you put this stuff in a capsule, you take it and you go to sleep, you sleep like a rock. It's amazing. Everything I research made me understand that if I didn't change my diet and try to find something that was going to help me eliminate all the pain that I was in, that I wouldn't be here much longer because it became too unbearable to just get up and go to our job. In that process, my doctors told me that there was a pain clinic and there was go see a counselor or employee assistant counseling to talk about all of this that was going on and just one medication after the next. And one day I looked up and I had like 17 different medications and I just wanted to do something different. My first experience with helping somebody other than myself was my mother. She was diagnosed with cancer in October of 2016. I actually had told her instead of taking sleeping pills and things like that, I was offering her smoke weed because that was what I knew to do. But when she was diagnosed with cancer, I was kind of at a loss. I knew that from experience of watching other people going through cancer, that chemotherapy was destructive and very, very sad and harsh. And But when she was diagnosed, we didn't know exactly the extent of it and then a couple weeks later found out that she was prob she was terminal by then already they gave her like three and a half months to to live i had basically decided within me that i didn't want her to go through with the treatments but if that's what she wanted to try to do as far as what western medicine was telling her fine but i was uh, asking her to try cannabis as well and then she was but how how much what do i take and i said i don't know i basically didn't know I just went out to a dispensary and was like, hey, my mom's dying. And I come here every week, five times a week to buy my own weed to smoke. You guys have anything that my mom could take that would help her live or at least like feel better? And they couldn't answer anything. Nobody knew anything. Well, we have this and we have that. And this is $90 and this is $150. I'm like, is the $150 stuff stronger, better, make her better faster? No. Well, we don't know. Um, how much do I give to her? I I'm not sure. And then CBD was the cure-all too. That was the other thing. You just need to give her lots of CBD. And I'm like, well, how much? What form? You know, do I rub it on her body? Do I put it in her mouth? Like, what exactly do I do? And it was, it was scary because they were willing to take my money, but they weren't willing to tell me what to do with this thing they were giving me for my money. They do believe in some of the studies, they say that smoking a joint, when it gets into medicinal aspects, you're getting anywhere between 12 to 16% cannabinoid absorption. The endocannabinoid system is complementary to cannabis, which is why it got named as partially endocannabinoid system. Um, cannabis in and of itself is hundreds and hundreds of different chemicals that we are now starting to pick apart and take a look at on a much deeper level. So you're smoking a joint, uh, some of the best weed there is, and you're still, even though you're 100% stoned and 100% medicated or high, you're only getting up to 16% of cannabinoid absorption in your body. If that's trying to kill cancer, that's not going to do anything when people take up to 1,000 milligrams of concentrated oil to battle the cancers. So that's smoking it. Then there's topicals. Topicals come in there also, and you get anywhere from, they believe, a 16 to 24% absorption with topicals. Edibles, they believe you get a 40 to 52 percent absorption. Rectally, you get from 86 to 91 percent absorption. But when you get into suppositories, you can't just make it like you make ganja butter. You have to use a refined oil, which has to be broken down in certain ways. This is a full plant extract, meaning that we cut the whole plant down, we soak the whole plant in a solvent, and whatever's made, whatever's left after we remove the solvent is the pure product. We keep it at certain volatile heat levels so it doesn't burn off certain properties and that's what the entourage effect is. Nowadays with all the legalization going on, the vape carts, that's called distillate. And so distillate is actually a step after you make 
the NHO RSO, the full plant extraction oil is in, is in a solvent. And then you take that solvent and what I do is I just remove the solvent and what I have left is my product. What other people do is once they remove the solvent, they take this product, they put it into a machine, they call it a mantle, they heat that up with vacuum pressure, steam and cool and cold air and they collect what's called distillate. And that's an isolation of THC. You are now burning off all of the entourage components. Everything is gone now and all you're removing is the THC. And so that's what everybody's using in the vape cartridges and stuff, which I believe is a generic high. I've had no medical benefits of anybody feeling any better with them unless they're having headaches, needed a quick, a quick appetite boost, or a recreational setting where they just want to smoke something real quick and move on. But when it came to all around healing, you have to internally eat it. It's, you have to ingest it. And I've stayed away from making edibles and stuff because a lot of it had sugars and preservatives. And those are the things that were preservatives were preserving the cancers and all the anomalies. And the sugars were just feeding the cancers and the anomalies. And so I just figured instead of me making edibles, I should create a pure concentrate oil that if you take a very, very tiny amount, it goes a long way. So instead of you having to have medicated brownies or a medicated cookie, I am now medicated. Whatever I eat is medicated now. I can have medicated lasagna, I can have medicated burritos, I can have medicated uh, tortilla chips, I can have medicated salsa because I am medicated. So I am the standard. I don't need all these other outside anomalies messing with me, especially when you have diabetic patients or people that are on heart strict diets. They just need to take a pure form of the oil. And I feel like that's the best way to do it. Instead of using all these extra stuff that just cause you know, food allergy problems or you know, I have people that are making the oil now and putting all kinds of essential oils in it. And no, it just needs to be the oil. Just stick to the plant. It comes to their face like they're designers again. And the plant has been healing for thousands of years without our effort. It's going to be here on this earth for thousands of years after we're gone. I've been using this medicine for years because I was addicted to opiates after I broke my back and they told me I had stomach cancer. And so I went after all these things myself because I didn't believe in their lies. I didn't believe in the tools that they're going to show me that I watched so many people lose their hair, lose their teeth, get their throats burnt out. They call it, they call it a burning in chemo and radiation when they actually zap the wrong part and you get these burn blisters. And I've helped people with Agent Orange issues to AIDS, dementia, uh, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. I, the list can go on forever. But at the end of the day, it's poor diet, negative efforts and, and negative community around people. And once you give them a positive good night's rest and you get rid of all those ailments, they wake up the next day, they eat better, they want to do things and have fun with their life. I had to go um, do my own research. I sought people in my, my surrounding. Um, there's a group on Facebook called I Love San Bernardino and I live in the city of San Bernardino. And I was like, well, why not reach out to the community and see if there's people within my community that can help me or know somebody who might be able to help me. And that's exactly what I did. I, I said, my mom's really ill. I have all these things that they gave me at the dispensary and I don't know what to do with them. Can somebody send me an angel who can just say, this is how much you give them or this is how much she shouldn't take or don't give her that, you know, somebody just give me some information. And a gentleman by the name of Robert Porter, he was like, uh, I know somebody. He doesn't live here right now, but he, I'm gonna contact him. He's in town and I'm gonna talk to him about what's going on in your situation and he might be able to help you. And I was like, thank you. Anything's better than nothing. Within a few days, he said he had spoken to Eddie and he said that I told him about your mom and he gave me some medicine and he, you're gonna give it. And on the back of this package, it says how to administer it to your mom. And I was just like, what? Wait, what? <laughs> okay um crazy okay cool you know and i was excited because like i was like i got an answer it's not the answer but it's an answer and i might be able to help her within 15 minutes of administering the medicine to my mom she was um she was happy and my one and a half year old niece was able to interact with her and it didn't make my mom sad or in pain because she was just complete she was like and then she pulled me aside and was like Cannabis is what's going to cure people, amethyst. Don't forget that, because she could feel it. She told me, when you give me, I was giving her Dilaudid on a, every four hours, and then I was giving her a fentanyl patch, and I was giving her so many, so many medications, and I'd put those things on her, and I watched her go from chill to just watch her feel like she's, like, scared. Mom, are you okay? No. 
I feel not okay. I, I, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I'm like, mom, you're not going to die. I'm just making you feel out of pain. No, that's not what I feel though. I feel out of pain, but I feel like I'm dying. And she said with cannabis, it brought life back into her. And so for me, that right there was all I needed to know. Like I knew my mom wasn't going to live, but I knew that she had life in her before she died. And so she was, she was better than if she was on opiates. And so that was probably the best healing for us as a family because she didn't want to leave us in turmoil and hurt in having a void and she wasn't when she left we were all there with her and she she we knew she went well because she was in a state of mind where we knew she was okay this isn't an isolate i don't take it and just take thc out no, we've learned that the entourage effect of this, all the constituents in the plant is what benefits the body. Our body has, it's a whole unit of symbiotic relationships and cannabis is like the conductor. In the meantime, I've also had a chronic pain problem. I have a bone spur on my lower vertebrae. I had been on uh, gabapentin, Vicodin, Flexeril. I had a nerve stimulator that I wore on my back. Well, now I had these edibles that I'm making for other people, and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to give it a try. First, I went off the Flexeril. Um, I had already gone off the Gabapentin. I was like, I'm sleeping good at night. And, and it was, I never went after this for myself. It was all about cancer. I wasn't trying to help myself, but it's helped me. It made me remember everything I ever wanted to do since I was young. I always told my mom, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up, but I want to help people. And therefore, I was like, okay, so she's basically explaining to me that I need to inform people. Just inform them. Give them some knowledge, and if they take it and they run with it, great. If they don't, then they don't. Okay, before I met Eddie, I panicked. After I met Eddie, I got a little uh, better because now I'm applying this native healing oil to my gums and I'm doing baked goods. I'm doing other products that started relieving the pain in the back, you know? And I'm like, okay, I might have something here. That gave me hope, man. Eddie had reached out to me and said, cause I take the medicine myself. My wife passed away two weeks after my mom passed away in, a, in an accident a block up the street from my home. And it put me in a depressed, uh, depressed state where I couldn't sleep. I started taking the medicine myself because he told me you need to take this so you can sleep and you, it'll give you the right kind of sleep and it'll help. With that, I was able to take the medicine and find out like, you know what, this is what I wanna do. I wanna help people that are like me and like my mom. And so what I started to do is I talked to him and he told me I have these medicine, this medicine and it's available to people, but people don't know about it. So what I did is I would take his pamphlet and I would see people that needed the help and I would explain to them how this helps and this is who you need to contact. Now to get on to somebody that was really helped by this, my husband, he had to quit work years ago. He um, had a mental breakdown. Uh, he's been diabetic since he was a kid, bad arthritis, he's had a few heart attacks, and he was diagnosed with dementia. I didn't even think to give him any of the edibles and stuff that I was working with or any, any of this oil, even though I thought, you know, I thought this, this really is a tool that everybody should have if they want it, if it's gonna help them. Um, but I didn't think about it helping him because he's already confused. You know, I'm not gonna make it worse. I, ran, I forgot to order his sleeping medication and the doctor was just getting ready to put him on, uh, it's the step just before hospice because I told her, I said, I, I am just overwhelmed. I said, I cannot take care of him the way I need to and take care of my grandson who I had and the grandbaby that my daughter had, and I was just totally overwhelmed. And um, she says, well, we're gonna put him on a pre-hospice and get you some more help. Well, I ran out of sleeping pills for him, and I was, he's just like frantic, I'm not gonna sleep, I'm not gonna sleep. So I gave him a cookie. I said, here, have this. The next morning he woke up and he said he slept so good and that he felt so good 
that he wanted to try that again. Well, now he's totally off of trazodone. He's off most of his psych meds. He was on prednisone every day for the horrible pain of arthritis in his joints. His, his, he can't lift his arms up because his shoulders are frozen. Oh God, he's fallen and broken his hip. You know, he's just a mess. He is off prednisone completely for the first time in years. His diabetes is way better controlled. And his, his mind is working again. He takes care of all his own doctor's appointments, all his prescriptions. Uh, he's picked up chores back in the house again. He does the dishes. He does the laundry. Yeah, he, he doesn't, he's not real good about separating the whites out, you know, but he converses like a normal person. He remembers where we're going tomorrow. This, this was his miracle and my miracle. This was it. Uh, to be afraid to give it to him because I thought it would make him more confused when he already had dementia. And to have it be what has helped his mind recover because he's not on all those toxic drugs anymore. I, I just, I think it's a tool that we should all be able to use if we need it. It should just be available to us. Um, I think it's a damn shame that the government has done things the way they have when they really need to be helping people, not, not hurting people and not denying him what can help them. I watched cancer with double mastectomies in my family and I have watched throats and voice boxes come out. What am I going to do now, you know? So I just got serious about being anti-chemo. And once I went and got on YouTube, my world changed. You know, Ray is like a ray of sunshine for all his friends. And I mean, he'd walk through the hospital and just seeing him would make people smile. And for me to lose this ray of sunshine to cancer was, was just horrible. And I said, whoa, Ray, Ray, Ray. I said, I, I'm gonna look some stuff up. I said, you wanna try this oil? I printed up a bunch of stuff for him to look at. Um, I said, let's, let's go get cards, let's go find this oil. We went from store to store and we, could, we couldn't find this stuff. We, we couldn't find it at all. We saw lots of, uh, lots of just, marijuana bud and uh, all kinds of different products and some edibles and stuff, but we just couldn't find it. And so I told Ray, I said, well, I, I said, I'll make it. I suggest you grow your medicine yourself. I suggest that you make this yourself. You don't need anybody's help. I'm no better than you. You're no better than me. We're all one. This medicine does show us that we all come from the same root and we all thrive in the same stock and we all have different leaves. Just grow, you have to grow, and you have to not let anybody be in control of you. And if you, like Rick Simpson's told me to my face, a lot of people are brainwashed by the white coat. Be careful what the doctors tell you. They're selling a profitable industry. We want you to learn how to grow this in your backyard using only water and making this medicine after four months of growing it. And you should be able to make enough to hold you over for a year, as long as you don't have a terminally ill situation. And if you do, maybe your friends will wanna grow some weed for you. It's pretty fun to do. You know, they have, uh, with the marijuana oil, the extract, they have, uh, uh, Rick Simpson shows a thing on how to make it. But of course, then you have to get the product to make it. And you, you know, you wanna make sure your product is good product. But I, I did, I, I, found, uh, I found product, Ray bought it, I made the oil and got him started on this. Before the diagnosis, I was enduring the pain and just taking the prescriptions. It was trying to think my way through all of this and then getting so overwhelmed with so much information would always have my head spinning. I was going a bad path and that's where I had to really change my life at. You know, even going into this avenue where I started using all these wonderful products that uh, Eddie had to offer with the native healing oil, you know, working out all the time and I, you know, I was killing my stomach because I was coming up with hemorrhoids and taking all kinds of supplements and not knowing how to 
flush my body properly. And it just one thing after the next, I was becoming a detriment to my own self because I was trying so hard. But uh, this got me on a path to slow it down a little bit because it gave me some hope. I would say within the first 30 days is when I actually started seeing it. And I've been going to the skin doctors and having surgery done. I have a cream at home, it's a jar like this that I put on my arms every night, twice a day, once in the morning, once at night, and it peels my skin so it can peel the layers of the cancer off. I have not used that since I've met RSO. I, have, I still have that jar, that $30 jar of stuff that I don't use anymore because I just take a, make a pill of this and I take it and it takes care of me. And that's what I like about it. I've been making my own seeds and my own plants because I do believe the diversity of this oil is what actually is, is the success of the oil. You can't just make OG Kush or sour diesel oil and expect to cure everything. Because cancer is a very, very smart organism. And what that thing does is figure out what we do and how it can live off of it. So if you can constantly change what's killing it, it'll never figure out the combination on how to kill you. And I've figured that that's what I believe and that's what I push in. And you have to have an allotment of diverse genetics. And you have to understand growing and quality proper medicine without pesticides and without other things that are going to cause problems that people do to grow weed in their backyard and some of these big companies do it in their warehouses too they spray crazy stuff on those plants too there's a lot of different modalities of administration just like we have with regular pharmaceutical prescriptions you can use an oral pill you can use a oral pill a spray in the mouth you can use something that's been mixed in with food also known as an edible you can use the classic flower smoking in a joint or in you can vape in a cartridge you don't have to vape oil right now that's unfortunately not the route we're recommending until we have figured out what's going on in in this day and age of vaping lung deaths and lung incidents we have a few ways we can do this i mostly suggest that people put it into a capsule they sell capsules at your health food stores and stuff like that and uh, they separate themselves and I tell people about the size of a grain of rice into the capsule and take the capsule uh, You can take a pill anywhere. Nobody has a problem with pills going anywhere. You take the capsule It's more of like a time release it takes up to 40 minutes before it actually releases in your stomach And now you have the duration of six four to eight hours of, of relief Or you can pull it off put it on your finger eat it right off your tongue and the onset of that is Minutes two to three minutes. You're feeling warm in your body and it's a quick onset of relief but it's also, it doesn't have a long duration. You only get about two hours, an hour and a half to two hours of relief. So I just recommend people that are really going, that need a lot of help with chronic pain, um, debilitating disorders, put it in a capsule and ingest it, take it. If you're having a really bad problem, take the capsule, put some on your finger, take that too. You get the immediate relief. And when that starts to wear off, it's barely kicking in what's, what you took in your gut. And I do believe that your stomach is your first brain. You have to eat it, get into your first brain and make sense to the one that we think with because this is the one that's into it. It's intuition and that knows that you're feeling good. It knows that the healing has been put in you. And it's way different than your mind. Your mind is thinking about, oh man, you know, my mom better not know I'm stoned. My boss better not know I took a little bit of medicine. Oh, and that's your mind. But your gut is like, thank you, we need this. It releases what's stuck inside of you and it gives you enlightenment. Yeah, so CBD, we learned about CBD around 2008, I believe, 2008, 2009. A good friend of mine, Ed Borg, out of Delta 9 Labs in Amsterdam, was creating genetics and came up with a plant called Canatomic. And we didn't understand what was really going on with it at first because nobody was really getting high. And then we figured out it was CBD. <laughs> so we were like, oh, wow, this thing is like, it's not getting as high, but, you know, people's pain is going away. So this is interesting. So that's when the cannabis industry, if you want to call it, we call it a community at the time. 2008, we're still a community because... When they figure these things out, they access some of us to work with these genetics. So we're able to get some of these genetics and, and actually start experimenting them with them with people. And so when you take a look at each one of these chemicals, we're starting to see the body respond differently. And it's this balance that we're looking at now to see when could something be lacking? So when could it be that our body is lacking in CBD? There's a lot of theories out right now floating around about autism and CBD and seeing what, what part of this spectrum can we match up?
For years, we've known that autism uh, is a diagnosis that we've had around. And for years, we haven't been able to figure out how to treat autism. And part of it is, is because we don't understand the, the chemical imbalances or the physiologic imbalances of autism. So now that we're starting to look at it from a different perspective or a perspective that we never approached in the past, such as the endocannabinoid system, one of those things that we're looking at is, is could this be a deficiency of the endocannabinoid system? And is that why we're seeing a lot of changes and positive changes and positive outcomes for patients who start using cannabinoids in terms of better outcomes, better language control, less anger, irritability, and less anxiety? Could that be a part in this bigger diagnosis? When we look at where is CBD being kind of overhyped or really overly suggested is beneficial is sleep. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think that the data is going to pan out and looking through all the research, what we are seeing is, is that CBD can be disruptive for sleep as opposed to helpful. And one of the caveats to this is, you know, every once in a while people be like, well, but I use CBD for sleep and it helps me really well. And that's great, and I'm so happy for that, but the general, um, the general public really, I think, is being advertised falsely that CBD is helpful for sleep. There's a couple of reasons. Number one, it tends to be awakening or alerting. I oftentimes say you can't use something during the day that is awakening and alerting and then use it at night and it's magically now sleep-inducing. You have to pick a side, <laughs> can't be both. So THC tends to be sedating. I mean, we know the, the age old couch lock kind of concept and it plays out a little bit more than that. It does help for sleep. Whereas CBD, again, tends to be more beneficial during the daytime. The times I do see CBD beneficial for sleep is when there's pain involved and causing problems for sleep. So let's say you've got a bad hip or you've broken a bone and you're using CBD as a secondary or an additive uh, to your regimen, and that is what's preventing you from falling asleep, then yes, that will be helpful for your sleep. But if you've got insomnia for some other reason and it's chronic, or if you're taking you know, Ambien, Lunesta, Sonata, one of these hypnosedative type medications, it is very, very, very difficult to get patients off of those medications through the use of CBD. I find it is incredibly infrequent to have that happen. When CBD came, oh my God, I was a godsend. It's like anybody today that just hears about CBD. It's the most miraculous thing on the planet. And we really thought it was. And so CBD is an, has a non-psychotropical effect of cannabis. So you don't feel any effects, which you still do feel effects, because if you're in a lot of pain and you take a lot of CBD, that pain is gone. You're in a world, you're in a different, you're in, you're in a different space. You don't know what normal is because you're in constant pain. And when that pain is turned off, you're kind of lost for the first few times. You don't know what to do with yourself. And we learned that we made more people injure themselves, giving them pure CBD, turning pain off completely. With CBD, it, to me, it's a double-edged sword. I haven't had anybody beat cancer with just CBD. I've had epileptic patients, seizures slow down to almost stop using a lot of CBD. But the problem is, is we call it the CBD monster. You have to keep taking it, keep upping your dose. And it's really hard when you start at 50 milligrams of CBD, which you can get for, I don't know, maybe 20 bucks at a gas station nowadays, which is weird, but you get 20 bucks and you get 50 milligrams of CBD. But then you take that and then it doesn't work. And now you're spending $40 because you need 100 milligrams. And then in two weeks, you're up to 500 milligrams. And that's, that's almost 500 bucks some places. CBD just turns pain off. And my whole experience just turns pain off doesn't make you feel better, doesn't get rid of anxiety, doesn't get rid of inflammation. If you're gonna use CBDs, I recommend CBD to be used when people are getting out of surgeries and you need to m make somebody mobile. They need to use the restroom, take some CBD, go take a shower, go change your clothes, sit down on the couch, now just relax, get healed, get some rest. Oh, you need to go to the store, you need to go pay some bills, take some CBD, go get your bills done, be cognitively there. Don't take THC where you're kind of loopy and you're not all there. CBD is more of understanding how to utilize the CBD and how it benefits. When I meet people and they have diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, or cancer, and they tell me they need CBD, I directly start directing them to THC. Because once THC is used, it's everywhere. Low-grade THC can be found anywhere. High-grade THC can be accessed with the right people. THC is needed. You always need THC. 
and you need full plant THC, especially if you're using CBD for out of surgeries, because THC gets rid of the inflammation, gets rid of the irritation. Not only that, the CBD will turn off the pain, but the THC will relax you to where you don't go mow the lawn. You don't go wash the dishes and clean the house to where you injure yourself again and your family isn't enjoying you anymore again and you're bipolar because you're going through these pain issues in and out. And so the THC puts you on a level where it just makes you relaxed. The CBD lowers the pain. And in that, you have a little bit more respect for your healing. People are just looking for the quick fix, quick trick, and they're looking for that, oh, it doesn't show up on a drug test. Well, I recommend people finding a new career because money's not worth your life. Everybody I've watched die and didn't take a dollar with them or take anything with them. So working for the benefit for your children, it's not going to benefit anything if you're not here for your children. And if you're going to spend all of your money on something that's just the ultimate snake oil right now, enjoy it. It does have a lot of beneficial factors. And THC is the ultimate healer because if you turn down the pressure in the body, most of these anomalies never actually take hold. So if I can lower the pressures of anxiety, seizures don't trigger. If I can lower the anxiety pressure from the inflammation, they don't get anxiety from the pain from the inflammation. THC does that. CBD does not do that. Some people are completely afraid of THC. Fear, not knowing. They've been taught that this is a dangerous medicine and it's gonna make them a monster. They're gonna do crazy things that they've never wanted to do before especially our elderly, like they're just very ill-informed. It's They've been taught that this is a dangerous drug and that it's gonna make them do crazy things. And it's just explaining to them that it, it might make you feel funny. A lot of opiates that these elderly people are on make me feel funny when I've tried them. So I can tell them from experience of taking an opiate, it won't be any funnier than that, Phil. I guarantee you that, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not scary. It's kind of like a nice feeling. I think it's an, for me, it's an uplifting feeling and I think that's where the fear lies, that they're just not used to feeling that, that freeness. And it's just lulling them like, how do you, but do you feel better? And they usually like, yes. It's THC. THC will mellow that out. If you get home, you've had a hard day of work, there's no problem with people drinking a glass of wine, people smoking a cigarette. Now you can take a bong rip, you can smoke a pre-roll, you can hit a vape pen. Well, why don't you get good rest and take some full plant medicine and get your body to actually relax. We have more receptors in our stomach and our abdominal system than anywhere in our whole body for cannabinoid receptors. So the first thing we do is we detox our body and we completely flush our intestines out, get rid of all the stuff that's been preserved and foods that are stuck in our intestines and are just getting us sick, keeping us sick. The, all the preserved food that's stuck inside of our gut, it washes it out, clears the mind, gets you good rest. You wake up feeling refreshed. And so that's, it's really hard to put into context when people think it's just snake oil or it's just weed or uh, you talk to somebody that really understands you could get to a regimen that makes sense. Understand why you're using these things. Just don't use CBD because somebody told you it's going to keep your seizures away. Find out how and where do you get seizures from. My daughter, she was expecting her second child and she was having a really, really rough pregnancy. I mean, she was just in horrible pain. Of course, the doctors wouldn't listen to her. I, I worked with doctors, man. They, uh, and granted, they have a lot going on in their head, and I have a lot of respect for a lot of the ones I worked with. But um, some of them, they have so much going on in their head, they never hear what's coming into them. They, they make a decision before they even talk to you. She could not get anybody to take her seriously. And she finally got to where she felt like she couldn't breathe. I said, go to a different emergency room. And when they took an x-ray, she had a tumor in her liver that was so large, it was up into her right chest. So she, she went into the hospital. Uh, I, I wanted her to take the oil, um, but of course she was afraid to because she was pregnant. Well, then they took the baby and I continued to try to get her to take the oil. And the thing is, is my daughter taught high school French. She was a high school teacher. She said, Mom, she says, I'll, I'll, I'll lose my license if I test positive for THC. And I, I'm just frantic with wanting her to do it, but I also would never force anybody to do anything. I mean, she went through a lot of education to get to her, her uh, teaching credentials. She didn't want to take it and didn't want to take it. And then they told her she was dying and, and, then, and then she died. 
I don't know that it would have helped her. I believe it would have given her more time and uh, maybe come home, helps her help her quality of life, get her home to at least spend some time with her baby. I mean, it's a tool that we are denied. She was denied it because of this stigma. You know, she would lose her job. And so she couldn't even use it for the comfort it would give her towards the end. So when I talk to my colleagues, my other fellow physicians about cannabis, I get a lot of this. I, I don't know. I get a lot of, well, I can't talk about that because it's illegal. I get a lot of, I can't attend that conference because they're talking about cannabis and that would, that would create a problem for my practice. All of these fears that we that have been instilled in us as a medical community, I am working diligently on proving wrong. You know, healthcare providers in general right now are not doing a very good job of discussing it. And part of the reason for that is that we've been told this myth that we're not allowed to. When are we going to be encouraged to talk about this with our patients? When is this going to be required? When is this going to be taught in medical school, in residency, in internship, in fellowship? When is it going to be part of the discussion? When is it going to come to the table? When will we start talking about the medical indications? And that's been on the shoulders of the patients for a long time. Well, since I worked in respiratory therapy and I worked at the Veterans Hospital, the big thing we talked about was that people with air hunger now, a person that's dying from emphysema, they feel like they're suffocating. And so it starts with they feel like you've got something in front of their face until they feel like they have a pillow over their head all the time. And, and that's their life. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. They, they have a hard time eating because they can't breathe. Well, the Veterans Hospital actually started giving these patients synthetic marijuana oil to help with their air hunger. Uh, now, let me tell you, I've even put uh, morphine in a little inhaler thing for patients because their air hunger was so bad and we were trying to find some way to ease their breathing. And um, the thing with morphine is, is it works great to make you feel not short of breath, but it also makes you not feel like breathing. And so, you know, you already got somebody that can't get enough air in and out and now they don't feel like breathing. So it, it, it was really rough to try and give them that. The, med the medical marijuana oil that we gave our patients was like a, a, a lifesaver for many of them because it got rid of their air hunger, it improved their appetite. I mean, I can't tell you how many patients I talked to that, that this, it made such a difference for their quality of life. I still talk to them. I talk to them all the time. I'm teaching them now because I'm still here and I'm still getting better. My numbers are changing. I don't come in asking for a, a pain medication. I'm asking them for what the blood work says because I know what I'm doing for myself. All they want to do is hear what I have to say and document, and then they can lead me in the direction of whatever pharmaceutical company that accommodates that type, that type of pain. But if I don't come in with a pain, then where are you at psychologically? So having to turn people away is the worst part of my day. I do not write for recreational use of cannabis. I cannot risk my medical license or risk you being put in a position where you get pulled over by the police and the police look at your medical recommendation and blow it off because they think it's nonsensical or BS. We need to have these protections under the law, and in order to do that, we have to be really strict with who we allow to give these prescriptions to or recommendations to, because we don't want it ever to blow up in any of our faces. If I lost my license tomorrow, not only would it be a problem for me and my family, but it would also be a problem for all the thousands of patients that we treat. It would be a problem for all of the patients who no longer will have access to a physician who can talk to them about dosage and medication use. And as we talked about earlier, here in Los Angeles, we have about three physicians who are willing to go 
the distance and do these types of discussions, recommendations for patients and their families. Like Rick Simpson told me years ago in Amsterdam, this is what works. And he's not lying. And I've witnessed it. And the reason why I call it NHO, my company, Native Healing Oils, is because I'm not Rick Simpson. I don't call it Rick Simpson Oil. Rick Simpson doesn't even call it Rick Simpson Oil. He is, he's not that have a boasty person. It was called Phoenix Tears, Rise from the Ashes. That's what this medicine was about. Health, help, life, encouragements, and, and bringing youth up proper, self-respect, community respect, plant respect. There's a lot of tools here to help us. And everybody's been ridiculed and afraid of them because of crazy stories and all these other things. But we have to come back to the brass tacks of reality. You take this, you feel like a human being again. And that's one thing that is missing on this entire planet right now, unless you can get lost in nature. So as long as you're working every day for that big house and that nice car, for some reason society has told you that these things make you feel happy and then you don't. And then you get some messed up disorder or disease and you can no longer provide for that. You lose that big house, you lose that big car. You live on your kid's bedroom in a hospital chair, in a bed with IVs and tubes running down your mouth and your face and your nose. And you can't even tell your child you love them. You can't even laugh with your friend because you can't breathe. You don't feel good. Those are all the things that are happening all day, every day. And I believe that this medicine works for every single person. It's the personalities that we're dealing with, the upbringing that you've had. If, you're, if you have the strength to push through pain, and if you know that there's a better end of the effort, there's always a good story at the end of the effort, this medicine will help. This, this tool is very effective. But if you continue to eat terrible and you keep going to McDonald's and you keep doing terrible things, this medicine is gonna do absolutely nothing. You have to understand when I meet my patients and they tell me they have cancer, they have these disorders and they need my help, the first thing I tell them is that they have to be willing to get rid of the whole life that they lived before they met me and shook my hand. It is time to change and things are going to be different. You had a good run. 40, 50, 60, 70 years of eating whatever you wanted to, doing whatever you wanted. Well, maybe it all caught up to you now. You have this anomaly in your body. It's time to change it. That's what makes us human beings. We have the option of change. And we can change ourselves to believe in good and look at all the people that you witness that are using this medicine and nobody's holding the gun to their head. This is all their free will. They want to feel better. They're tired of the pharmaceutical system. They're tired of the medical system and the industry. I just watched on the news the other day that Kaiser is pretty ecstatic about the best profits they've ever had in their business. And which really sickens me to my stomach because I know a lot of people that are in Kaiser systems right now that can't even let them know that they're using cannabis. And they're profiting off the drugs that they give these people that they don't even take. And so there's all this misinformation out there because patients are afraid to tell their doctors why they're feeling better, how come they're feeling better, and they're getting all of these fake medications are getting the glory for cannabis. Because the thousands of people that I've helped have never told their doctor that this is why they're better. And they have all the prescriptions that the doctors gave them sitting in a bag underneath their bed. You can't change my mind. 20 plus years, over 5,000 people, I've seen go, and some of them have gone to other worlds. Some of them are in better places. Some of them are working on it right now, trying to be better than they were yesterday. They do get a good night's rest. They don't have inflammation and irritation. They're not anxiety and, and freaked out. They are not their ailment. You know, everybody's talking about, you know, F cancer, F this, F that. No, no, F what causes those things. They're gonna be here no matter what. So why don't you learn how not to fall into that conundrum of, uh, of its endurement? And you just, you just try to find a better way for other answers, question things. And don't be content until it resonates with your heart that it's right. And that's hard to tell people when they're used to saying, well, do I take this every two to four hours? Am I taking 100 milligrams? Or do I need to take 25 milligrams? Like, it's too much information. In Washington, when legalization went, patients were coming into our, our dispensary with prescriptions like that. 3,000 milligrams of CBD and 200 milligrams of THC. I said, where are you going to find this stuff? When has this made sense to this doctor to offer it to you? And that's where things started making sense. Well, if I can get them a first full nights of rest, I've gotten rid of so many more problems just with sleep. And this has given people the deepest sleep that they've had since they were children. And I've heard that thousands of times over. And that's the only reason why I use this today now. After they wanted to replace my spine, 
tell me I had all kinds of issues and they had a lot of, I was hooked on opiates for a long time. This got me off of opiates and for years I used to go to methadone clinics and help people get off of methadone and heroin using this medicine. We actually stopped my friend's 19 year old son from slamming heroin in his arm using RSO, NHO, Phoenix Tears, whatever you want to call it. I didn't do it with vape pens, I didn't do it with brownies, I didn't do it with joints. I did it with heavy doses of this. It took us two weeks for his son to get out of detox and not go into a hospital system. But I, we were able to stop numerous people from slamming heroin. And that's one of my most favorite things about this medicine. Everybody loves the cancer stories, people love the AIDS stories, but I get to stop people from taking opiates. That's one of my meanest, meanest efforts on this planet right now because it's the worst drug ever given to society. And you know what I'll do until I die? Is teach everybody how to make this medicine so they don't ever have to touch an opiate. Oh, I think the main thing that is necessary, which I, I believe my good friend Pete, me and him have been on the same wavelengths for quite a few years, is we need healing centers. We need understanding healing centers. We need places that, uh, like I explained earlier, it's, if you gotta find what you're good at and you gotta like, just thrive in that. You know, you can't just be good at this and then say you're good at that and you say you're good at this and then everything falls apart. No, you got to be good at what you're at and you got to find somebody that fills the gaps of all those things. And that's what a healing center will do. A healing center will bring nutritionists. It'll bring physicians. It'll bring nurses. It'll bring scientists and chemists. And it'll bring people that have been in this movement since the beginning of the signatures that have witnessed it on so many levels to just hear us out. You don't need to slap us in the face with science and and the understanding of what it is because we couldn't even talk about what we've done and what we've accomplished since 1995. And we've accomplished so much that it's legal almost around the world now, we're getting there. California's movement of medical marijuana is the true movement of cannabis. And I do believe that we need this in its own personal health systems, not in Kaiser, not in Blue Cross, this needs to be an independent building funded by independent people for independent human beings to walk in and get an independent understanding of why they need to use it, how it benefits them, how they can utilize it. And that's what I think is the most beneficial thing out of all of this. Open your mind to things that maybe you didn't think positive about before. Be open to people using what helps them, whatever that may be whether it's medical marijuana, from being somebody that was so against it, and I've seen so many people helped by it, and I, I haven't seen anybody overdose on it. I haven't seen anybody uh, be addicted to it. When you have something that's, that's safe and effective for many people, not, I mean, obviously not everybody, everybody's different, but... Uh, be a little bit more open to what's in front of our face instead of rejecting it. I can take that product and it'll give me a calm, which will give me an opportunity to wrap my mind around, eat that bowl of cereal, have a piece of fruit. And if you can get that in your gut and start your body to function in, in its natural, that's what you're trying to do because that energy is going to bring more life and you're going to be able to inspire somebody else to get some good habits. If we stop demonizing, you make people reach at it even harder when you want to keep it in that state of being illegal. Whether or not you believe in God, or you believe in, you know, evolution. Either way, inside of these, these little meat puppets we're riding along inside of, there's a system, endocannabinoid system, and it only talks to cannabis. And if you believe that we evolved, then for something like that to evolve took probably tens of thousands or millions of years, you know, and, and it was very special, a symbiotic relationship that we've now been thrust into a time and an age where we're being told that it's, it's dirty and it's terrible. It was demonized. We ignorantly in America think that we got it all figured out. We got this great system. 
And the most important thing about any society is caring for people and their health. And in this society, we send people to a place where they give you hopelessness, where they fill you full of drugs that make you sicker and make you then rely upon more drugs. And, and we exist in this system, what we think is so great, and we're torn away from our natural habitat that has every last thing that we ever needed. And, and, and again, if we evolved, that we evolved with, and now we've been crammed into this little box of synthesized goop that's now being pumped into our natural bodies and making them sick. So right now what we're seeing a lot of is this dichotomy between patients wanting to be honest with their doctors, which is what I always suggest and wholeheartedly recommend, and at the same time physicians turning their backs on patients who do use cannabis products, again because of lack of education. It's not because doctors want to turn patients away. They want to engage with you. They enjoy engaging with patients. They, they thrive from helping people. That's why they go into this business. Otherwise, it would be a big problem. That being said, if we don't educate our patients or our physicians, we will, we will find a place where patients are gonna start being dishonest and it's gonna cause problems medically for them. We're talking about you know, perioperative changes in medication usage and how much anesthesia patients need, but I can't tell you that if, you don't, if you're not honest with me. If you don't tell me that you're using cannabis products three, four times a day, I can't tell your surgeon and your anesthesiologist that they need to up their dose of anesthesia because you may still be awake when you go under. So let's have these open conversations and let's make sure that our physicians are educated. Things, things are so different than I thought they were. You know? you know, you do this whole everything is black and white, but as you get older, hopefully you begin to realize that there is no black and white, it's all gray. And so I think that we need to have people with the understanding, the spiritual understanding of what, what medical cannabis' movement for 20 years was about. It was about getting sick, reaching out, finding help, and then building friendships and relationships. I'm 67 years old. I didn't even know how sick I was. You can't, I can't tell you how much energy I have right now. Take this man that you see, this old man sitting here, and I could do what a 20 year old could do today right now. That's how I feel. There's already gonna be propagandists out there saying it's snake oil and they don't understand it. It's hoopla and it's, it's, it's herbal healing and it's all sort of you know, weird compartments they try to put us in to segregate us. No, we're, we're normal people. We, you know, we work regular jobs. We have families. We, we you know, wanna to go to dinner parties and you know, we wanna experience a good time while we're here. And if you fall into a little situation, you should have a place in every community that you can walk into and have the understanding from people that have been doing this for a lot of years. Most of the people that go to a doctor understand that they just need some treatment. And that's what they don't do right now. There's no care in healthcare. And there's no health in healthcare either. And it's, it's a business. And so that's what's needed is a care, a facility to care for these people that's funded that we can sit there and just wait for somebody to walk in that door, whether they have a two month old baby or a hundred year old grandmother. It's the same community. It's just people wanting to feel better. And that's what's, what's really needed. And I have this whole scenario thing of, you know, I've, I've worked in a lot of different worlds when it comes to medicines. And one of the experiences that I went through is I, I had this, this epiphany thing is that I try to live this life right now of what the healthcare system was when they kind of found it. You know, in the 1600s, if I would've got sick, I'd send my son on a horse into town which would be a two or three day trek. He'd get there and there'd be a receptionist there with a pad of paper and a note for him to leave a note. And that note would be directions to my house and who I am. And the doctor, he'd get back and he'd get this note, he'd jump on his horse and ride to my house, gets to my property. So when he gets there, he walks up to my property and all of my vegetable garden is dead. All my livestock is gone. He opens up the door of my house and I'm sitting on my couch and my foot is swollen, I have gout. I have all these problems with me that I brought on myself. And you know what the doctor says as soon as he walks in my door? He says, hey, lazy, get back in your garden and water your vegetables. Quit killing your livestock and have them fertilize your vegetables. Stop being so lazy and gluttonous. Have a purpose for this planet. And the doctor would say, you're wasting my time. You selectively did this to yourself. 
there's somebody over here with an infection, I need to go help, and you're just wasting my time. Instead, today, we make an appointment, which is like 30 days out, you sit in a sterile, pristine office with 20 other people. The time that you were supposed to be there comes and goes, but God forbid you're 10 minutes late. They won't see you for another month. You walk into his office. He never looks at you in the face. He's looking at it. Well, now they're looking at a, at, a, at a tablet. They used to look at a clipboard. They never look at you. They never ask you how you're doing. They never know what's really going on in your life. They prescribe you a couple of prescriptions. They kick you out the door, and then it's just a cattle run. The next one's right behind. And marijuana has been, since the beginning of time, they've been using it as a medication. You know it, I know it. You know, this man here, he's managed to come up with a product that's unreal. I walk into homes, I talk to people, I open their fridge, I see what's bothering them, I drive around with someone to doctor's appointments. I've administered suppositories to people. I do what it takes to let them understand the compassionate healing of cannabis and what Dennis Perone looked at me in my face and told me. This is about dying people. It's not about your life. I love you, Dennis. It will kill cancer. It will kill cancer. If taken in the right way, it will kill cancer. It's not a, does it kill cancer? It does. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs>